Hello everybody and welcome back to another video. In today's video, we'll be walking through an easy Windows box from CyberSec Labs. This is unattended and let's jump straight into it by looking at the Nmap scan. So we'll run Nmap-P- which will scan all the ports there are. Then we'll also say dash capital A and that is going to enable OS detection, version detection, script scanning. So it's just going to run all the scripts and, and, and detections that it knows. That will yield us some results, some open ports. A lot of them are just basic Windows ports that we would expect on any Windows machine. And from all of these, port 80 is the most interesting. So this is HTTP and the version it says HTTP file server, so HFS. And that is what we'll be initially looking at. If we look at what's running on port 80 on the HTTP server, we'll notice that there, the software is running and at the bottom it says server information HTTP file server 2.3. Now, when I get software and I see a version number, I always want to look up how old is this software and are there any vulnerabilities for this specific version. So for example, in this case, let's just use the easiest way and that's using search exploit. So we'll say search exploit HTTP file server. And if we run that, we come up with a lot of results here. But the one we are looking for here is the Regetto HTTP file server. Now, why Regetto? Well, if you look closely at this URL here at the bottom, it says uh, www.regetto.com. So that's how I know, okay, this is Regetto. And if we look at these results here, we have a remote code execution. A couple ones, these may be the same ones, but there seems to be even a Metasploit module. So that makes it very easy for us. So let's try to run that Metasploit module and see if that remote code command execution works on this HFS. So I'm in Metasploit here and I'm first going to start off with a search for HFS. We immediately find here this one exploit windows HTTP regetto HFS exec. So this is the one that we want to do to run. So we'll use one and now we can do show options. So show options is going to show all the options that we can set. Um, we don't want proxies. We need to set our hosts. So let's set our hosts to be the IP address of the box. Let's keep on looking here. That seems all fine. And then L host, I don't want this uh, on this address because that is my Ethernet, Ethernet zero address. I want to proxy it through or run it through the VPN from CyberSec Labs. So that's why I'm going to set L host to my ton zero interface. Now, if I run this, we'll see that a lot happens here. So it's starting a re reverse TCP handler. It is using a local URL. So it starts a web server and sends malicious requests to the server. It receives a payload and then it gives us a Metapreter session and we can go here into shell and we'll see that we have a shell as the user pink. So if we run who am I, we'll see, yeah, we are the user pink on this box and that is how you get access to that user. While it is obviously really interesting that there is a Metasploit module for this that will do all the work for us, that's not the point of why we're here. We want to learn. So let's dig in deeper into how this exploit actually works. And for that, we first need to understand macros. So in HFS, there are macros. In the documentation, they say that macros are uh, that server side scripting is possible through commands, also known as macros. And these commands, uh, there's a ton of possible commands and they always have the same form. So they take the form of a curly brace open dot then your command, a pipe character, your arguments, and then again, dot, and then closing curly brace. So that is the structure of a command, the, of a macro. Different commands we can run are, for example, the upper command, which is going to uppercase an argument. But there are, in specific, two very interesting commands that we can run. One is the save command. So save is going to take, as the first argument, the file that we want to save to on the file system. And the second command is going to be something to put into that file. So what we're going to put into the file. The second interesting command is exec. Exec is going to take as one argument and it's going to take a file that is going to execute. Now, maybe you can already 
start thinking about what we're going to do. It should be pretty obvious we are going to save a file to the file system and then exec that file. However, these macros, do they just work everywhere? No, they don't. So we first need to find a place to, to run those. Well, that's what the researchers that found this vulnerability did. They looked at the search parameter. So the search is a get parameter where you can search through the file system for files. Now, usually you cannot run uh, macros in there. That's, that's not allowed because obviously any unauthenticated user can, can run that. So that's what shouldn't be allowed. However, in the validation, the researchers found that if you first send a null byte, so in HTML, a percentage zero, zero, that then what follows is not being checked anymore and actually runs the macros that it contains. So all we have to do is send percentage zero, zero before our macro, and then we can actually execute them. So let's get started with our proof of concept here to prove that we can use this to get remote code execution. So what we're first going to be doing is sending a save. We're going to save curl my IP to a file. Why curl my IP? Well, I just want to see when we execute this, I want to see requests back. So I'm going to have a listener open on my machine just to see that if we get a result back, then we obviously had remote code execution. So I'm going to save that string curl my IP to a file. In this case, I chose C users public and then slash script dot bat. With that saved, with that run, obviously we cannot verify that, but we just have to assume that that worked. We can then go to our exec command. In our exec command, we are just going to supply one parameter and that is that C users public slash script dot bat. Now, if we send that request and we take a look again at our listener, we will see that we actually get some requests back to our web server. So we've just seen, just manually ran this remote code execution and manually verified how it works and, and looked a little bit deeper into it. And this is something that I have advised you always do when you use Metasploit or any automated tool to also go through it manually, even if it's just really quickly, just to verify that you understand what's happening and that you would be able to replicate it on your own. Moving on from there, we're obviously only the pink user and we want to get the administrator on this server. So let's try to escalate. So first of all, what I did is I used Metaplatter to easily upload WinPs to the box. So in Metaplatter, you can just say upload and then your file and then it uploads. So then I had the file sitting here, wimpiesany.exe, and I ran it. So WinPs obviously shows a lot of output and I'm specifically only looking for things in red here. So I'm gonna scroll over this pretty fast. And now we come to something interesting. Here it says unattend files. Now, what are these files? These are kind of answer files that explain to Windows how to uh, install. So when you want to do an un unattended installation, so for example, let's say you have uh, 100 computers and you want to install on all of them. Obviously, if you're going to do it manually, you have to enter information, stuff like that. And that would take a long while. So using these files, you can already preset that information and just install them all unattended without having to be there, without having to help. And that's what these files are. Now, these files are interesting because they contain a lot of information. So in this case, let's look at this file, this Windows Panther unattend.xml file. So I'm going to go down here and say, well, type out that file for me. And let's quickly look through it. So the beginning is not that interesting a lot of Windows stuff, some, some IP stuff here that's not really interesting. However, here we get to user accounts. User accounts are interesting. And then the, the next thing is administrator password. And obviously that is super, super interesting. And here we see this value, seemingly a password. It says plain text true. So that would mean this is a plain text password. So let's copy that and see if this is indeed still the administrator password on this box because that is definitely a possibility. If this machine was installed using this file and never changed, it could be, could be that this is the password. So earlier we saw that a very specific port was open and it's port 5,985. Now that port can allow remote access, uh, obviously authenticated remote access and using evil WinRM, a very cool tool, we can actually 
get a shell that way. So we say evil winrm i for the IP. We want the user administrator with the password that we just recovered. Uh, this, that this dash p is not even needed. But if we run it, we will see that we actually get a PowerShell shell as the administrator user. So if I do who am I, we can see that I am indeed the administrator and that is the path to root on this box. So I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope you, I hope you learned something new. If you got stuck on this box, try to review the steps, try to see what you missed. Uh, and I hope to see you back for another video, of course. Take care. Goodbye.